Welcome to our sharing on the book of Genesis. I'm wanting to finish chapter 39 and I, I left you in the situation where Joseph was being severely tempted on a daily basis by Potiphar's wife. I don't think you could call Potiphar's wife a temptress. Her behaviour was anything but a temptress. She used no seduction whatsoever to try and get this young man to agree with her. She acted in an imperious way, uh, presuming that a slave couldn't possibly say no to someone of her rank. So she had a very high opinion of her own rank and a very low opinion of Joseph's. But when you look at it from a much higher uh, position, from a spiritual position, Joseph behaved like a prince of God and she behaved in the most dreadful way. Uh, and so her behaviour is reprehensible from any angle that you look at it. And what we need to look at is that I think that Joseph is a hero and that he's a model for the younger generations today, that he would risk his life and he would risk what he got, 12 years imprisonment, just to be faithful to God. There's someone who loves God and someone who truly fears God and truly considers that what God wants is the thing that you live by. So Joseph is a real model for us. I, I think it's wonderful. Um, I said to you before that you might ask the question, why was the story of um, Judah and Tamar put in there in chapter 38? Uh, because it's, it was breaking the story of Joseph. And I think the logic of the writers was that you were shown the unchastity of Judah, who should have been one of the ones to become a patriarch. And here you're shown the chastity of Joseph. You were shown the unfaithfulness of Judah to God's commandments. And here you see Joseph's uh, commitment to God's commandments to the point where he would risk his life in order to obey God. So you look at Judah and you see he doesn't love God and he doesn't respect God's commandments because he specifically and consciously uh, broke away from the, the laws about the Leverate marriage, for example, and also about the fact that he shouldn't have married the Canaanite himself. And here you have Joseph uh, adhering absolutely strictly to God's law. God's will is what governs his life. So now you understand why the whole story of Joseph is peppered with the one statement, the Lord was with Joseph, God was with Joseph, God was with Joseph. And no matter how bad things got, Joseph absolutely shone in every single set of circumstances that was given to him. And he showed the nobility of his person to anybody who had eyes to see and anybody who had any kind of perception. If you examine the text here, you'll see that there are three different stages in the temptations to Joseph. Uh, the first approach is given in, in verse 7, and then it's persistence on a daily basis in verse 10. And in verse 12, he decides he's getting out. He can't, he's not going to deal with this. Uh, and he runs. And unfortunately, she grabs his garment and she has evidence to hold against him. This also points down the line to the three temptations of Jesus in the desert. But he deals with it, of course, naturally on a much, much higher plane. It's just that these figures in the early part of the Bible are just foreshadowings, hints at the greatness of what will come eventually, because Jesus was able to turn to the tempter and just simply command him to go. A completely different thing altogether. So Jesus's victory was much greater than that of Joseph uh, but for little people like us, it's lovely to see the way Joseph was so faithful to God. In verses 16 to 18, the woman has this uh, evidence, Joseph's garment, um, and so she accuses him falsely. And what you find is that Genesis shows that Joseph doesn't defend himself. And of course, this also points down to the New Testament where Jesus was accused falsely, and he also didn't defend himself. You could look at this as weakness. 
But you could also look at it from the angle that both of them would have seen it. Jesus, of course, on the highest plane. And that is that you even forgive your enemy to such an extent that you wouldn't accuse them of anything. And you wouldn't show any anger. You wouldn't show any reaction to them. This is very interesting. And watch this in Joseph all the way. He keeps his eyes on the Lord and on trying to be faithful to God. So he is not looking at the others are doing. And I think that is a very good uh, piece of advice to have going forward in life, that if we would keep our eyes focused on the Lord and on what God wants of us, then we won't allow ourselves to be dragged into the, the, the mud of what's going on today in terms of immorality. Joseph didn't defend himself. And Joseph found himself imprisoned, we will discover, for 12 years as a result of this. But there's a question you should ask. There's several questions you should ask, and one of them is, isn't he a slave? Why do they keep him alive? The normal thing in that situation would have been Potiphar is very highly placed in the government, has the ear of Pharaoh, and so it would have been so easy to have Joseph executed. That's the end of it, he's only a slave. But he wasn't. And not only was he not executed, he was put into the special part of the prison where only the Pharaoh's personal prisoners are. So you really have to ask what's going on. Won't answer it for a moment. And of course it points down again to the fact that God's beloved son was imprisoned uh, unjustly also, uh, but they in the end actually killed him. Now, why wasn't Joseph able to defend himself? Or was it a choice on his part? Uh, and what was Potiphar's reaction? Potiphar's reaction is actually a very interesting thing, but people need to examine the scriptures well enough to get to this kind of thing that I'm going to show you. First of all, it was divine providence taking care of Joseph because God was with Joseph and nothing was going to happen to Joseph because God wasn't going to allow it. And Joseph needed to be in the particular part of the prison where Pharaoh's prisoners would be because that was his key to getting out. In those days, you could, if a slave was thrown into prison, that's you gone for the rest of your days. Nobody would ever even remember you and nobody would think you had any rights and therefore nobody would go seeking your release. After all, you're only a slave. So a slave has no value. Uh, and so it had to be that the Lord was with him. Now, but there's a clue given to us. And I think you have to be, you know, a Sherlock Holmes coming to the scriptures uh, to really look for the clues that's actually given to you. And you're told that what happened, that is the accusations against Joseph and Joseph not defending himself, even though Potiphar knew that Joseph was utterly dependable to the point where he put all his household and possessions and everything under Joseph's care. You don't do that if the person isn't dependable. So you're told that Potiphar's anger was aroused, but it wasn't against Joseph. And look into that. Uh, so we're told that, as I said, Jesus was also accused and he didn't open his mouth. In fact, the scriptures said he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and like a sheep before his shearers, he was silent, he never opened his mouth. So this anger of Potiphar, in which he did not do to Joseph what anybody would have expected, tells you that he didn't believe his wife's story. But he couldn't honor a slave after the accusation uh, because there would have been enormous questions asked and the wife would be found out for what she actually was. And so Potiphar has to walk a very delicate path. Um, and instead of putting the slave to death, he puts him into that safe prison. Uh, and for appearances sake, he has to do this to try and save the wife, save his family's reputation and somehow not kill Joseph. Now Potiphar doesn't know there's a higher power at work. He doesn't, he doesn't know God. Uh, he doesn't know the true God. 
There's lots of detail about uh, these stories that's not actually in the book of Genesis, uh, but if you go to the ancient book of Jasher, you will find details that are very interesting that tie threads together. Uh, and they make it very clear that uh, Potiphar suspected his own wife to be the problem and said that uh, Joseph was thrown into prison for 12 years. But I'll show you that the book of Genesis eventually gives you that information as well. So now that Joseph is in prison, only God can set him free. Nobody else will ever, ever think about him. And the interesting thing is when you go to look at the prophetic level of it, uh, when it came to Jesus' time to be accused and to be thrown into prison, the very man who was going to kill him, which was Pilate, declared him innocent three times. But for political reasons, for appearance's sake, he did this awful deed. The next point I want to make to you is that Joseph suffered at the hands of the Gentiles just as Jesus suffered at the hands of the Gentiles as well. And it was his own brethren who betrayed him into the hands of the Gentiles, just as it was with the case of Jesus, that he was betrayed by his own uh, brethren. We're told that Joseph suffered severely. This is what the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verses 9 to 10 says. Uh, this was Stephen's speech before his own martyrdom. And he spoke about Joseph's afflictions and he said, but God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles or all his afflictions. Psalm 105 verses 17 to 18 also speaks about Joseph and they said, they bruised his feet with shackles and his neck was put in irons. So there's an awful lot more to this story uh, than we actually realise. So this is uh, an extraordinary trial given to this young man. Now, he's only 17 or 18. He's about 18 at this particular time. It's, it's an extraordinary trial to actually give to him. Will he pass the test? Now, passing the test doesn't mean surviving in jail. He did that. Will he survive trusting God? Will he survive with his relationship with God intact? Will he survive still using his gifts for other people and still serving other people? And being very humble? And the answer is yes. Joseph gets 10 out of 10 for all these tests. It's absolutely incredible. And so you're told in verse 21 uh, that the Lord was with Joseph and he gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Now, the Lord was with Joseph when he went to Potiphar's house and gave him favour in the eyes of Potiphar. And we're going to see that when he's taken out of jail, the Lord will give him favour in the eyes of Pharaoh as well, who will also put him in charge of his entire kingdom. So God is really guiding him. And what Joseph is telling us here is be humble. Bow before the power of God now and someday he will raise you up. And that was exactly the message that St. Peter gave to the early Christians uh, in 2 Peter 5. The very same message. And not all the circumstances of your life will be wonderful. Um, many of them will cause you uh, deep suffering. But if you would humbly submit to what the Lord is allowing to you, then God will do what he says in Romans 8, that God will bring good out of any situation if only you love him and you trust him. And of course, that is the story of Joseph. So verses 22 and 23 were told that it didn't take long for the keeper of the prison to recognise the gifts that Joseph had. So he must have taken him out of the stocks. But Joseph only had to speak to somebody when that person realised there was extraordinary wisdom and understanding there, which is proof of a deep relationship with God. Uh, and so Joseph was put in charge of the administration of the whole prison. So this wonderful gift that God had given to him uh, of administration is recognised by everybody and they give him his head they allow him to do it and it all always worked out uh, Joseph gave all his attention to actually running this prison very efficiently so that the prisoners wouldn't have to suffer more than they had to and that the guards wouldn't have more work than was needed 
And so he brought peace into what could have been a complete hell. Joseph's authority was recognized by everyone. And so once Joseph was put in charge, if he said something should be done, it was done. So notice that he's in training to rule and God is giving him smaller tasks before he will give him great tasks. And that is what happens in training. Uh, if you can manage the smaller one, you're given a greater one and then you're given a greater one. And whatever he did, it prospered because God was with him. So uh, I think it's very beautiful uh, to see his fidelity under these very, very difficult circumstances. And it's, it's when a, a person is really suffering like this that you recognize the nobility that is within. It was when Jesus was hanging on the cross, dying in the most horrendous way, that the very men who executed him said, that man was a son of God. He had to be. Nobody else behaves like this. They were used to uh, people, it was usually men that were crucified, so they were used to men cursing and swearing as they were dying because the, the pain was so atrocious. But here was a man forgiving everybody, taking care of his mother, looking out for everybody, still keeping his relationship with God and totally trusting God with his soul. They weren't used to that. Not at all. So let's go on then to chapter 40. And what you have to understand is time passed because altogether Joseph is about 12 years in the prison. He's 10 years and then there's a plus two, which I will explain to you. So it came to pass, that means a long time, uh, after these things, that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt, and Pharaoh was angry with these two officers, the butler and the baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. That was the place that's being run by Joseph, um, where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph to take care of these two uh, who were belonging to the household of Pharaoh. If you read this on a very superficial level, you won't just get what's going on. Obviously, there was a plot to poison Pharaoh. And the officers of the, the court said to Pharaoh that the two most obvious people who could do it were the butler with drinks and the baker with food. And so the two men are thrown into prison, what we call the usual suspects. And the investigation uh, has to be carried out. But notice that their justice system was different to ours. You put them in jail until you find out which one is actually innocent and one of them uh, isn't innocent. But they could be abandoned to just being in jail. So Joseph now has his first contact with the household of Pharaoh himself. And both Potiphar and the Lord wanted this because Potiphar had great respect for Joseph and it must have cost him an awful lot to have to put Joseph in prison. When it comes to the Lord doing something, he's only the creator of heaven and earth. It's just that nothing is impossible with God. But because he's the creator and nothing is impossible to him, he doesn't have to have some huge event in order to accomplish his tasks. He uses the simplest possible means to achieve his ends. And the, the simplest possible means in these circumstances is that Joseph is a dreamer of dreams. Joseph can interpret dreams. Joseph has wisdom and understanding because of his union with God. And therefore, God can actually speak through Joseph and give a prophetic message to somebody else. That is Joseph's key to freedom. And that's his key to the future. And that's exactly what God is going to do. The two officers are in prison. And to make a, a, a story really good, the two of them have the dreams on the same night. And they have a similar kind of dream that in three days, this is going to happen or that's going to happen in the normal way in their ordinary lives in Egypt, they would have uh, gone looking to the necromancers or the wizards or the pagan priests or whatever 
but all uh, people in contact with the occult to get the answer to their dreams because people in those days took dreams very, very seriously. And here they were in prison, they couldn't consult anybody, so they got depressed. And here you have Joseph, also a prisoner, but actually looking after these two as well, asking them what is wrong. And so they tell him that they've had these significant dreams and there's nobody to interpret them and that's why they're depressed. And he said, that's no problem. Tell me the dream. Because after all, God alone can give you the interpretation of your dreams. If the dream came from God, God will tell you what it actually means. And of course, there's Joseph in union with God and already having the gift of interpretation and so Joseph could tell them. So Joseph turns out to be the means of salvation for one and the means of judgment to the other. So he tells one of them that in three days time, which is Pharaoh's birthday, uh, he will be released and that's the butler. Uh, and then he tells that Pharaoh is going to find you guilty and he's going to hang you in three days. In three days, it actually happened. So everybody has the testimony. By everybody, I mean those running the prison, the other prisoners, Pharaoh's household and Pharaoh himself will have heard what actually happened. And that's very important for what will continue. And so uh, Joseph actually asks the butler who is going to be set free, would he remember him? After all, Joseph is doing him a great service. And he asks him, would he remember him to Pharaoh? Because Pharaoh alone can get Joseph out of prison. Nobody else can do it. And so he actually tells the butler that he himself is an innocent victim. He has done nothing wrong. And he was hated for no cause uh, and that he was sold as a slave. But in actual fact, he's a prince in his own uh, homeland. And so uh, he asks the butler to tell the story to Pharaoh. And because if Pharaoh interviews him, Joseph knows that God is on his side. Did the butler do it? No. And what you have here is the selfishness and the ingratitude that seems to be endemic in the human race, that if a person gets what they want, that they walk off and they completely forget others. If you even look at Jesus at the Last Supper, do this in memory of me. How many, how many remember it? How many enter into the Eucharist and let him come to us and let that remembrance be a true life experience, so many, the vast majority, have really forgotten. So again, I want to underline for you that Joseph never refused to serve. Joseph never rebelled against the divine providence that allowed this awful experience to actually come to him. And Joseph never refused to use his gifts to help others. And so you, you see somebody here who can become great because he doesn't allow the negative feelings of bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment and all of that to take over his life and to destroy it. He doesn't allow that. He knows that forgiveness is the key to happiness and the key to heaven. He knows that. Probably God himself taught him. Uh, and because of that, he can actually serve and he will serve what, what the chosen people would have called a pagan king. He will serve him because everyone is a child of God. So Joseph was able to share his knowledge of the future. Now, the butler is only going to remember that at a much later stage, and he's going to cause Joseph to be kept in the prison for two more years until he remembers. And he's not going to remember until Pharaoh has dreams. But the, the evidence is there, and that evidence is actually very, very important. So this, this prophetic gift is clearly being seen in Joseph. Uh, and as you go through the Bible into other books of the Bible, uh, you'll find, for example, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and all the other prophets, 
they have a relationship with God. And because they keep their relationship with God alive, because they enter into union with God, they're able to receive from God and they're able to tell the whole nation what is going to come because they see it from God's point of view. They're not just looking at history from a basic point of view. I now want to go into chapter 41. The only way that Joseph is going to get out of prison is for God to give some dreams to the king who happens to be the greatest potentate of the day. He's running the superpower of the day. This man has uh, the life and death of all his people in his hands. He has enormous power. And yet he doesn't have the ability to understand his own dreams. He needs other people. So Joseph had to wait uh, two full years. And this is what it says, the beginning of chapter 41. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other cows came up after them uh, out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows by the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. And so Pharaoh awoke. Couldn't understand this. Why would one set of cows actually eat the others? So he's given something that his own intelligence can't get. And then we're told... He got the, the same message in a different picture. You can read that, that for yourself. And then, because he doesn't understand, he sends for the necromancers, he sends for the wizards, he sends for his uh, court, he sends for the priests, he sends for everybody. Nobody can make head nor tail of the story. It, it is inexplicable to them. And Pharaoh gets really upset. Why doesn't anybody understand? After all, all of these people are being paid by him to do the work that they're actually doing. And they're useless uh, to actually help him in this particular situation. So it's under this stimulus where Pharaoh is upset and nobody can help him that the butler remembers there is somebody that I have met who can interpret dreams. And this is God's way of opening the prison gate for Joseph, and we move from his death in the prison, spiritually speaking, to resurrection outside. We move from his humiliation as a slave to his exaltation as a king. And it is so swift that if Joseph hadn't uh, corresponded very, very well to grace all during that 12 years, he wouldn't have been able psychologically to deal with the transformation that was in his life. He has been trusting God beyond reason for 12 years. And so the time has come for God to actually move and to help him. But why did God wait so long? If I give you a hint from the book of Exodus, you might get it. Descendants of Jacob were uh, slaves in Egypt for 400 years. It took them so long to turn from complaining about their sufferings to actually turning to God in prayer, to really interceding with God and praying in such a way that God actually could give them a liberator. And by the time God answered their prayer, the people were ready to leave Egypt. Moses was ready to go there to lead them. And all the circumstances were ready. So Egypt had to be ready for Joseph. And Egypt wouldn't be ready for Joseph without this crisis that was coming. And the crisis that was coming was a very severe famine. That's what makes Egypt ready. What makes Joseph ready? It's because he has been trained for long years in suffering. And therefore, his whole spirit has been honed uh, by the grace of God. And he is ready now to serve on a much higher plane than he has served before. 
but he has learned how to serve people who might naturally be enemies. He has lear learned how to serve them without questioning their, their background, their religion or anything else. And therefore, he can be used as a saviour for the whole of the Middle East with all their multiplicity of gods and all the rest of it. And he can do it peacefully and he can be a saviour for them all. It's very interesting uh, to look at it in different ways before you actually go into the story. Now, I want to look at it from Satan's point of view because he's always involved. Satan roams around the world looking for the ruin of souls. Now, Satan is the origin of evil and he's the evil one who wants to destroy everybody. Satan would have seen very clearly that Joseph was the chosen one, Joseph was the special one, Joseph was the prince, Joseph was obviously going to be the next patriarch. So we have to bring him down, we have to destroy him. And so he used the hatred of Joseph's brother to get him into e Egypt. He used the sinfulness of Potiphar's wife to bring him down and get him thrown into prison. He used the selfishness of the butler to not even remember that he had been helped and he had been released. And so what Satan is doing with all of that is trying to thwart God's plan for the chosen people. And it's perfectly clear that Joseph is the one. He's the important one going forward. Satan would be happy that a famine would come because they can all die in the famine and therefore God can't rule on the earth and Satan can rule through all his evil ways. So there's different ways of actually looking at the thing. Here, here's sort of Satan doing his negative stuff and there's the sinfulness of human beings doing their negative stuff. And over and above it all, the Lord is with Joseph and he can write straight with crooked lines. There's nothing he can't do and there's no circumstance that he can't actually enter into. It's, it's really beautiful to see how the whole thing actually works. And by the time Joseph is actually released from prison, it's the right time for Egypt, it's the right time for the chosen people, and it's the right time for Joseph himself. And the extraordinary thing is that we're going to see in the chapters that follow this that Joseph's brothers have been eaten up by their bad consciences for all this length of time. They have not dealt with the fact that they tried to kill and destroy Joseph and that they don't know actually what happened to him. And therefore, God is going to use the famine in a huge way, uh, not only to keep everybody alive and to have Joseph as a saviour for the whole of the region, but he's actually going to use it also to bring reconciliation into Jacob's family and also to heal Jacob's broken heart because he thinks his son Joseph is dead and he's going to discover that he's alive and well and reigning and the sun, moon and stars are bowing down before him because he's ruling the superpower of the day. The Pharaoh hands everything over to him except the throne. And to sort of use the language of his own dream, that's the sun, moon and stars uh, bowing before him. And to use the language of the first dream, the sheaves, then his brothers come desperately needing grain because they're all starving. So it's fascinating the way the whole thing actually comes together. Now, I told you when we were dealing with Shechem that in the story Shechem meant the world. Uh, when you're dealing with Egypt here, Egypt is the world. Uh, and the reason why I say that is that the, the Bible tells us that God gave the chosen people the land and the land was known as the country of Canaan initially. Uh, then it becomes the promised land. Uh, and then finally, as we know it today, it's Israel. And so the land always represents the chosen people and other places then uh, that are actually dealt with in the Bible can represent the world or something else. So Egypt represents the world. And none of the magicians or the wise men uh, or the priests or anybody else in that world full of false gods had any wisdom to help Pharaoh. 
as soon as Pharaoh lays eyes on Joseph, he knows he's dealing with somebody of a completely different caliber. And Pharaoh makes an instant decision about Joseph, just as Potiphar did. A little detail that you mightn't think of, and that is that Potiphar was one of the high officials in Pharaoh's household. So Potiphar would have been present at this event when Joseph is presented to the king. What Pharaoh needs is a true man of God, someone who knows the only true God that there is. And through Joseph, God was actually about to introduce himself to Egypt. God is always thinking on the big picture. And through Moses, 430 years later, uh, God will also come to Egypt to try and bring them out of their idolatries and bring them into the truth. So God is always seeking his children. It's the father of the prodigal son all the time. And the human race is the prodigal son. It's Egypt at one point, it's Babylon at another time. It's my country and your country and the West and the East and the South and the North. But he's always looking for his children and he always wants to bring them back. The two dreams that Pharaoh has have prophetic significance about the near future. Both dreams actually have the same message. It is that if Pharaoh only had the first dream about the cows, he might have dismissed it. But when the thing was repeated with a different image, then he realizes, no, somebody's communicating with me. And what he needs is someone who can truly represent the true God, who can tell him the truth and will not be afraid to tell him the truth. Very often, a person in the position of Pharaoh finds that his officers won't tell him the truth. Why? Because they're afraid they lose their jobs or whatever. Centuries later, when you go down to the book of Daniel, uh, you will find that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the infamous king of Babylon, also has had dream and he desperately needs somebody to interpret it. But his wise men and necromancers and priests and all the other, they can't do it. But Daniel happens to be there and Daniel is a true man of God. And if you compare how Joseph deals with Pharaoh with how Daniel deals with Nebuchadnezzar, it's exactly the same. Both men show absolute respect for the king and they, they take a position of humility and they're most willing to help the king. Uh, and they're most willing to serve. It's really beautiful. And it's th through both of them, these kings learn something that was expressed by St. Paul at a much later stage, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And that love comes through to Pharaoh, through Joseph, and came through to Nebuchadnezzar, through Daniel at a later point as well. All of all the injustice that came to Joseph and all the humiliation that came to him, uh, the shame of being a slave when he was a prince in his father's house, uh, the coat of many colours, the sign of his high calling and the sign of the fact that he was a prince will be restored to him. Because the coat of many colours is worn by royalty and Pharaoh will give it back to him. That's the incredible thing. His father gave it to him at the beginning of this story and the most unlikely person on the planet gives it back to him, which is the Pharaoh of Egypt. So Joseph will go from the death in the dungeon to the throne of Egypt, just as Jesus went from the hell of Calvary to the throne of God's glory also in his resurrection. In verse 14, it is God and his intervention that actually gets Joseph out of prison. This is what it says. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved and changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. So he had to be dressed up properly. He couldn't arrive as a prisoner, could he? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there's no one who's able to interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream and interpret it. And Joseph gives his first revelation to Pharaoh. It's very beautiful and it's in total respect. But his first respect is for God. I am nothing. God is everything. 
he says to him, it's not me. God will give Pharaoh the answer of peace. Now, before he ever hears the dream, he's able to tell Pharaoh that you are going to be happy with the interpretation of this dream. He was able to tell the other two men very, very quickly as well what the exact message of their dream was. And here he's able to put Pharaoh at ease. He has never met the man before. He has never spoken to a man of this rank before. And look at the freedom that he has to speak man to man. Now, Joseph is a very young man. We're going to hear in a few minutes that he's 30. That's how we know he spent 12 years in prison because he started out being 17. And here's a very young man facing the greatest potentate of the day and facing him in complete freedom. You see, I've heard it said that if you will look God in the face in prayer, you'll look any man in the face without fear. If you're afraid to look in the face of God and look at the truth of who he is and the truth of who you are, yes, you will fear other people. And so to be completely without fear, uh, Joseph speaks as a totally free person. They've taken him straight out of a dungeon and Pharaoh sees that he's not only looking at a free person, he's looking at a mature adult, he's looking at someone who is truly spiritual, he's looking at someone who is ultimately utterly free. It must have been a point of complete astonishment for Pharaoh and for all his courtiers. They would never have seen that before. The normal thing would have been that if you drag someone out of a dungeon, that they are all coward and that they uh, can't lift up their head and they wouldn't talk to you and they have to be beaten to get them to do anything. Instead of that, they see a man of royal dignity speaking to them. Yes, he's coming out of a very humbled and lowly position, but in himself, he is a royal prince. Pharaoh sees it, acknowledges it, and moves. We'll continue the story next time. Slána Gospanach Day Live. Goodbye. God bless you. I want to give you a little message from me, and that is that the Word of God is the second great food that God has given to us. The first one is the Eucharist. The second one, the manna from heaven, is the Word of God. And the third one is prayer. But in order to give people the Word of God, a lot of people have to do an enormous amount of work. They have to go into a great deal of research and do a lot of homework. You mightn't realize it. Jesus told his apostles that the laborer was worthy of his hire. And in other words, that they were to feed the people spiritually, but that the people should enable the apostles to be able to do the work. So I want to make a little uh, plea for you on behalf of Shalom World TV to ask you that if the Word of God is really feeding you, if it's giving you life, if it really is what God wanted it to be, and we're trying very hard to do that, that you would respond by enabling them to be able to continue giving you this. Your donation would actually give life to others and enable them to work. And the Lord would reward you and we would be very grateful. Thank you. Searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.